Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Game Nintendo Com video. We're going to be discussing the Xbox One as a whole, and perhaps more poignantly, how people's opinion of the machine have changed in just the last couple of months alone. I think it would be fair to say that if we were to go back when the Xbox One was first unveiled to the world and before Microsoft started to, as Sony say, changed its message, it would be quite a good prediction to say that the console wouldn't have gone well if it had launched right then and there, or more to the point, if Sony, uh, sorry, if Microsoft had kept on at the same path. However, in my personal opinion, and I'm pretty sure many of you would agree, and most of the media does anyway, that the Xbox One is starting to become a lot more favourable in terms of the light of the public, in terms of the public's perception. The system is starting to pick up some steam, and... I think it's fair to say that a lot of the stigma that had been just surrounding the machine like a stench of a decaying corpse had actually pretty much gone at this point. Uh, most people now are just looking at the machine uh, for its own merits versus the PlayStation 4's merits, and of course they're trying to make a decision, well, you know, which machine do I buy? Now of course some people are going to buy both at launch, other people are just going to make the choice of one. And for many people, of course, it's a pretty big decision because, let's face it, if you look at the uh, lineup of games and then you look at the launch window, which is pretty much, you know, exactly the same launch window. Uh, we believe both machines are going to be available pretty much at the same time. We don't have an exact date uh, at, at the time I'm recording this video anyway, which is the 25th of August. We don't have an exact date of the Xbox One's launch, but we know it's going to be pretty much the same as the PlayStation 4's, give or take a week or two, uh, most likely. There were, of course, as many of you are aware, a couple of really major blows to the Xbox One at launch. One of them wasn't really Microsoft's fault, per se. Um, and that was the whole Prism scandal. I'm sure many of you are aware of that and how people were so concerned about the privacy combined with the Xbox One and everything else. Now, of course, some people are going to say that Microsoft were complicit in it. Other people are going to say that no, Microsoft weren't complicit in it, regardless you can't argue the fact that for Microsoft, no matter which way of the political fence you're on on this, they were just unfortunate. Like, it basically came at the worst possible time. And then, of course, you had the, well, deal with it argument uh, regarding, of course, internet connectivity, and people really wanted that. And then, finally, you had even smaller issues, like, for example, um, the headset, headset, I'm sorry, not being included in the box. And it's little things like that, like when you buy like a, a console, which in the UK at least is going to cost you like 430-ish pounds, to say to someone, by the way, also you're going to need a headset with that dude, they're not really going to be exactly happy with that. I mean, okay, you could argue that, you know, you can use Connect, and people did, you know, Microsoft did argue that, but the problem with all this is then you're issuing a confused message because you're saying, well, Connect um, is more than fine to play online, but then in the marketing spiel of the headset, you say this is basically mandatory for and you know for serious online gamers. So which one is it? And stuff like that pisses people off, especially considering that your rival, in this case the PlayStation 4, actually bundles this in for free. But enough harking on the past. What about now? Because that's the important part. You know, six months ago, three months ago, two months ago, even a week ago, it doesn't matter compared to right this second. And things are starting to improve somewhat. Microsoft are very keen to argue that they've got the best lineup of any console ever. So that would, of course, mean like end of everything from like the Genesis era all the way to, of course, the PlayStation 3 and 4 even. Um, and... For the most part, I would agree that the Xbox One's launch isn't too bad. You've got titles like, for example, Dead Rising, uh, Dead Rising 3, Forza 5, Killer Instinct, uh, Rise, and a couple of other titles as well. I would not, however, argue that these are going to redefine gaming. I would not argue that they are going to be killers. And I'd argue that they do a fairly reasonable job of helping to f stave off the PlayStation 4's onslaught. In my opinion, the PS4 does have one slight edge, at least to me, and this is a personal perspective and choice only, in that I really want Killzone Shadowfall. But I have to confess 
that's pretty much the biggest game for me at launch. Um, and by no means, you know, is it the, the ultimate game or anything like that. The one that I really want from the PlayStation 4 isn't going to be a launch window. It's going to be apparently before March 2014. Uh, and that would be infamous. But there you have it. Now, of course, another thing that Microsoft have managed to change recently is the Kinect technology. And by which I mean the fact that originally... They said that the console would not work without the Kinect. In other words, not only would it be, you know, not only was it a, a requirement for then, it's almost like, you know, the system would say, well, you need to connect the X, the Kinect to go forward. And it wasn't as though it was just something they wrote into the software, but Microsoft had actually said that the system requires Connect. It would be impossible for them to change this. It was, you know, the system was designed, and then lo and behold, of course, they switched this. Not too many people actually caught that little, uh, uh, that little turnaround there. But still, um, for the perspective of consumers, it's good that you could disable Connect and unplug it. Of course, uh, disabling it or unplugging it, whatever you choose to do, so you decide to unplug the damn thing because you're paranoid about, you know, prism or whatever. Let's say you decide to unplug it. Well, in that case, certain aspects of the console, of course, being able to say, for example, Xbox on, that's not going to work, <laughs> rather obviously, because it's a connect only function. Microsoft have, however, stuck really to the guns and said, you know what, we're not going to launch a system without Connect bundled into the into the box. And just how good Connect 2 is going to be really depends. I've had some people message me and say, well, you know, what would you say compared to the PlayStation I? You know, what which one do you prefer, or what do you think of the you know Connect te uh, technology? And honestly, my uh, my answer has been pretty similar. Um, as it stands, I'm not really a big fan of either. Um, that's just me personally. I don't really like the PlayStation I. I don't really like Connect. I don't really think that they're like super useful as control methods. But they could have some some implementation for certain titles, for example, horror games, um, which has been mentioned by a couple of game creators. You know, for example, they can monitor your heartbeat or reactions and that type of thing. But I think it's really going to depend on how well it's implemented. This is going to be one of those situations where I don't think it's going to work so well for cross-platform titles. And my concern for this is pretty simple. It requires the game developer to really start implementing something that they know that maybe 50% of their audience... Let's just assume the game sells like one on the Xbox, one, one on the PlayStation uh, 4. So in other words, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so 50%. Uh, let's say the game sells 100 copies. That means 50, 50 goes on the PlayStation 4, 50 goes on the Xbox One. So probably that was a bit of a superfluous analogy. You guys probably understood what I meant, but still. Um... In that case, you're basically programming features that are only going to be really experienced by like 50% of the customers. Um, I suppose technically the PlayStation I could also do some bits and bobs as well, but still. I would argue that one thing I do like about the inclusion of it is at least it gives uh, Microsoft some options. The only problem is it comes at a cost, quite literally, in that it makes the system more expensive. However, it does give them some ability in the future, let's say two years' time, and the system sales are starting to stagnate a little bit. You would expect so. I suppose it depends on what the prices are like and what the market is like and so on. But let's say the system starts stagnating a little bit in sales. They can always say, well, you know what, here's a Connect free bundle because, you know, let's say players are only interested in titles like Halo and COD, just for example. They don't need Connect. This is for you guys. Um, and then they could have it almost like a, the premium and core version. So you could buy the Connect later on as a separate issue. And people would be pretty happy with that. I don't think many people would complain. And Microsoft could easily say, well, you know what? The market changes in two years' time. Sure, we said at launch that it would never happen. But, you know, we've seen that we have a significant consumer base that potentially want this. So, you know, we, you know, we have to go for that. Perhaps the biggest benefit, if you will, for Microsoft recently is Don Matrix's departure. And I know I've really ragged on the guy previously, but honestly speaking, he was 
I, I don't know if he was being brainwashed by Sony or paid lots of cash or if he just, you know, really hated Microsoft or whatever. If I was Don Matrick and I honestly was trying to do the best I could as a job, I would have done the following. I would have walked into, whenever I went into an interview, whatever I was thinking of saying, I would do the exact opposite and say the exact opposite thing because you would have probably been more successful. Um as a whole, because whatever the guy said was just bad. I mean, it was getting to the point where I personally, when I was reporting in the news, I I, I just, you know, I, I just thought to myself, this is just ridiculous. What is he saying? I mean, the, the classic one that I don't honestly think that anyone can let him live down was the, the rather ridiculous, um, well, we've already got a piece of technology that could play offline. It's called the Xbox 360. Great, that's certainly going to sell the Xbox. You know, what else do you want to tell them? Microsoft, of course, are trying to do a few good deals. For example, they've got some uh, exclusive launch DLC. I'm sorry, the, um, the DLC for the Call of Duty will launch initially on the uh, Xbox One. That sounds a bit better. We also learned that COD is going to have its own dedicated servers for the Xbox One, which is pretty good considering, of, of course, that COD is a fairly popular game, so to speak. Uh, FIFA is also going to have a downloadable code for the Xbox One. I don't know if that's in the United States. I um, didn't actually check that, which is a bit weak for me, to be honest. But still, it's going to be like that in Europe. And considering that FIFA is pretty popular here, I suppose that's, well, good. Personally, I could give a rat's ass, and I lament the fact it's a downloadable code. So I you know, could actually trade the game in for something I, well, want. But regardless... There are some issues with the cloud that I've discussed. For example, one of the things I don't like about dedicated servers is the fact that, well, let's assume that a company, whatever company it is, six months later, 12 months later, 24 months later, pick your time window, decide, well, we don't actually like to keep paying for this because we no longer feel that this game is profitable. Uh, yeah, so we're going to take down the servers. What happens then? Will there be a title update, the last title update? Let's say they're on one point, you know, one point uh, ten. Will there be a title update for one point eleven, which will enable, you know, the game to still be played online, but no longer dedicated servers or what? Um, because obviously, if not, that means the game online is basically useless because the servers are offline. And I don't kind of like that, if I'm honest with you. One of the benefits, in my personal opinion, of no dedicated servers is that, you know, anyone can host it. You can host it. I can host it. Your cousin in, you know, your cousin in Australia can host it. It doesn't matter. Someone can host it. It does have some inherent issues. Primarily, for example, latency, uh, host advantage. And of course, there's a really, really fun one if the host connection drops. But still, um, I'm really, in a perfect world, dedicated servers are like the happy fun area where no one has any issues but I always have that concern well what about if they stop supporting them and of course a game like Call of Duty sure it's going to sell well but realistically in three years time let's say the Call of Duty uh, Ghosts is your favoriteest Call of Duty ever and they release like Ghost 2 or Ghost 3 let's just make up a couple of titles and you hate them for whatever reason because you know you don't like the weather control you don't like the weapons you don't like whatever and let's say that therefore you continue to play uh, Ghosts 1, the original one, well, how or how long do you expect a, you know, a developer to continuously support something that's continuously draining them money? Of course, one huge advantage that Microsoft have is the fact that Xbox Live is always already so damn well established, and Sony no longer have the, well, our online is free. Not that I blame Sony, that's that's beside the point. I understand that they needed some extra cash, um, for example, for server maintenance, better delivery networks, especially now they're teaming up with Rackspace. This isn't something that they could just pay out of their own pocket. You know, these things do cost money at the end of the day. But no longer are they able to say, well, you know what, this is free, and well, you know what, Microsoft's is pay. It's no longer a marketing difference. And to be honest with you, I don't really think the cost is that much, especially when you consider that you do get some free games, um, which is pretty cool, in my personal opinion, you know, giving away free games for a, you know, for a marginal, insignificant fee. I don't remember exactly what it is. I think it's like three or four dollars a month. Um, it's pretty decent. It's, 
you know, a good way to play lots of games, a good way to basically get free titles, of course. If you've already just bought that game, say, two months ago, and now you're getting it for free, you might be a bit pissed, but that's beside the point. In my personal opinion, um, at Gamescom, I didn't really think that Sony's conference was that good. I don't think it was bad, as I said in my analysis of the conference. I don't think that they, you know, screwed up. I don't think that they had a bad conference. I don't think that they made any huge blunders. I don't think that the PlayStation 4 had a terrible, you know, announcement or anything like that. I just felt that the message was a bit um, copy and paste. It felt like they, they were recycling the same thing over again and I also think that they really pushed the Vita quite a bit it was obvious that they really want the Vita to become a lot more successful than what it has been which you know it's been okay it hasn't exactly been the greatest the biggest flop in gaming history but it was nowhere near the popularity that maybe they expected and certainly hasn't been able to take on say Nintendo's 3DS with that said I was actually watching the Gamescom uh, live feed for the Sony conference and I was actually reading the live chats on a separate screen because so I've got dual monitor set up and I was reading some of the comments on a couple of websites because you know I had a couple of streams set up and my goodness people were pissed at the Sony conference. I was surprised. I mean on the streams that I was watching anyway, people were really angry about it. They were pissed about the delayed launch in the UK. They were pissed about... Um, so much emphasis being pushed on the indie games and they were pissed at a couple of other bits and pieces as well and they were really not as happy as I thought. Um, the problem is of course you are dealing with a vocal minority and this is by no means a good section or a good segment of the market compared to a couple of streamers who of course are going to rant and rave about pretty much anything and no offense to any you know stream watchers I'm not saying that you guys you know uh, don't have just cause sometimes but you know getting really angry about you know one or two things it kind of seems a bit silly at times but there you have it um i did like the fact that sony of course are starting to push the creative vision more for indie developers in my opinion that's really good because i've always said that i think that the gaming market at least the last couple of years i mean if you take a look and some of the retro titles we're talking like the playstation 1 era the genesis era and you actually look at the really popular ones you'd be surprised at some of the, the really popular titles like sonic and so on if sonic had been released today i honestly don't know or mario even i don't and we're talking like innovative titles so in other words it never been released and now it just been released first things first I think it would have been a big hit. I think it would have been popular, but nowhere near the the levels as it is now. And that's not just simply because that, you know, gaming is it's now an established franchise. I just don't think that as many people have given it a chance. If you hear Mario, you immediately just associate it with something that's cult, and that's because it's been well established. Now, of course, the most popular titles are like you know Call of Duty, and it's a ridiculous risk for studios to actually release anything else, and that's one of the reasons that microtransactions exist. As much as we all hate it, it's one of the ways to monetize a title a little bit more. Sony, of course, have really been pushing the indie developers and said, well, you know what, it's a great way for us to learn, for us to breed more creativity in gaming. Microsoft basically were ruffle stomping on the creative vision, at least the opinion of many people, including the developers, because they were basically charging um, for updates and worse, you actually needed a publisher, and that just didn't work. If you'd already basically had the ability to publish your own games, if you'd already secured the funds, if your game was ready to go, why in the balls would you want a publisher to then basically take a percentage of your profits? It's quite kind of like me saying to you when you're a little kid, oh, hey, buddy, um, I know you're going to start doing like, you know, a window cleaning round, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to be your manager, and you say to me, but I don't need a manager. I'm already going to the people's houses and I've got... No, 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 no. Trust me. I'll be your manager and I'll take care of your marketing. But I already do my own marketing. All I have to do is go do it. Do no. I'll be there and I'm going to take a percentage of your profits because they won't deal with you otherwise. And it's true. You know, 
the, the, your customers would suddenly say, nah, sorry, uh, yeah, we're going to need him to kind of be the middleman here and to deal with it. It just doesn't make sense. It's a crappy argument. I know that wasn't exactly the greatest analogy in the history of mankind, but still, it's just not a good way to do business. And Microsoft really pissed off some people, and they've changed the policy, which is a great thing in my personal opinion. And this is a good indication of what I've been saying for a long time. Microsoft as a company is evolving, right? It's you've got to remember that in terms of the tech industry, Microsoft are old. Um, as a company, you know they're not, by, by no means as old as say one of the banking companies or say Fox or you know some of the established newspapers or whatever you want to, uh, you know financial institutes or say some of the, the accounting firms or whatever you know those companies that seem to have been you know synonymous with whatever you know have been around a hundred years or whatever. But in terms of industry, in terms of the tech industry, they are, they've been around for a long time and they're starting to realize that, oh shit, you know, things are starting to change substantially. Uh, they're getting a new CEO, for example. Uh, Steve is starting to starting his retirement process. Not that I blame the guy. He's served Microsoft, what, uh, 30 odd years now? I think 32, 33 years. I honestly can't remember exactly. But he's been there a while. I mean, he, you know, Bill originally hired the guy back in like 1980, 1981, something like that. Um, and of course, Bill Gates has stepped down to do other things. And now Steve's starting to step down or starting the process of stepping down because he realizes that, you know what, um, my time here is past and we need someone else. And of course, now they've got, say, Julie Lawson Green to replace Don Matrick as well. So, of course, for Microsoft, they've got some DLC, for example, for Call of Duty, for, uh, which, of course, is going to be initially. You've got the call, you've, it's pretty much tip for tat. You can almost say, okay, well, when you're doing a console launch, you could you just you could have wrote a prediction and you could have won a you know you could have won a bet, for example, with someone that you knew that was what was going to come out. You knew there was going to be a first-person shooter. You knew that there was going to be a oh, I don't know, driving game, you knew that there was going to be some type of slightly innovative game, and you knew that there was going to be something else, and you knew there was going to be something else, because you have to try to appeal to as many people as possible, and you also need that title to be relatively safe. So, of course, you want to try and wheel out a franchise that people know about, people care about somewhat. And let's just be honest, many people are citing the difference in performance technology. They're, they're citing, for example, you know, the bandwidth for the PlayStation 4, they're citing the amount of GCN cores that the PlayStation 4 have, which, you know, to anyone who's looked at the specifications of both, it doesn't really take someone of massive technical know-how to know that, say, the T-flop computing performance of, like, 1.32 or whatever it is of the Xbox One compared to, like, 1.84 and... Um, for example, and of course, the T-flop performance went up a little bit for the GPU over, uh, increased speed of the Xbox One, just for those of you who don't know. Um, the performance, for example, of DDR3 uh, combined with the ES RAM and a few other bits of bobs, you know, it's there. And some people are really citing that. They're going to say, well, the Xbox One titles are definitely going to start suffering. You're going to start seeing, you know, sub 60 frames per second, maybe variable frame rates. You maybe see like sub 1080p uh, internal native resolution. So in other words, it would upscale it as it was outputting it. So for example, it could be, I don't know, 1792 by whatever. Uh, and that would be upscaled to like 1920 by 1080 and maybe it'd be variable frame rate rather than fixed at 60. Maybe you have slightly inferior textures or shadows, whatever, you know, insert your, insert your scenario here. The bottom line is, however, graphics do not equal a successful console, right? The PlayStation 3 versions of titles were generally, and I emphasize the word generally, inferior to the Xbox versions, and that's just because of the architecture of the Xbox One, uh, so Xbox 360. It's also somewhat to do with lazy ports, that's somewhat to do with Sony's own fault as well, because their tool chains at the launch of the, uh, of the PlayStation 3 kind of sucked. Um, you know, Mark Cerny, who's the lead architect of the PlayStation 4, he admitted that. He said, you know what, our tool chains, our libraries just weren't good enough. And, you know, they're so focused on creating the cell processor and a few other bits and pieces, the main architecture, in other words, of the console, 
they didn't really think to say, well, you know what, it's giving us the performance we want, but we basically have to jump through hoops at the same time as juggling chainsaws and also avoiding people trying to shoot at us with rocket launchers simultaneously to get the performance we want. And of course, now it's gotten a lot easier. They've managed to make multiple performance increases on the PlayStation 3, so it's no longer a case where, say, the game is drastically inferior, like much longer loading times or whatever. It has improved. One of the reasons for the lengthier loading times is because of the system RAM for the PlayStation 3, which is 256 256, 256 for the GPU, 256 for the main memory, as most of you probably know by now who are regular viewers. Um, a lot of that was actually taken up by the operating system. We're talking about the memory slice, uh, sorry, the operating system uh, took away a lot of the main system RAM. It's a large slice of it. They released an update which reduced the footprint, which was good. Um, and then, of course, drastically reduced loading times because that means, of course, they don't need to worry so much about texture compression. The other problem with the PlayStation 3 versions of the titles, obviously, uh, it needed to utilize the swap file, for example, on the console because of the Blu-ray's slow-ass loading times. Um, compared to the Xbox 360, not to say the Xbox 360 versions were scotch-free, because, of course, they needed to be spread over multiple discs. I never really liked the idea that it was using DVD to begin with. I didn't like the fact that it didn't have a hard drive as standard. There was a couple of other things I didn't like as well, but there you have it. Um, if you go back in the mists of time and you start looking at the, the various Game Boy uh, uh, get releases compared to, say, the consoles at the time, for example, the classic one would be the, the Neo Geo or the... Uh, game a uh, Game Gear, which of course was from Sega, and then you compare those to say the graphics of the Game Boy, you see a slight disparity there. I mean, for Christ's sake, the Game Boy was literally green screen, quite literally a green screen with you know a couple of colours on it, compared to not exactly a full colour display, but you know a colour display is basically the same as the Master System. I can't remember how many colours it was offhand. I think it was like 64 or something, completely arbitrary number. It might have been 65,000. I honestly can't remember, but it was no. I think the I think the Mega Drive was 65,000, whatever. Um, and yes, I will go and look that up later because it's going to bug me of what the old specifications of like consoles released in the 1980-odds was. But regardless, you know, the Game Boy had like 8K of memory or whatever, but no one cared. People cared about the games. And that's the same thing for even the PlayStation 1. Like the PlayStation 1 versus Saturn. You know, Saturn absolutely was awful in terms of the libraries because of the ridiculous complexity of the design of dual CPU, dual GPU, which was one of the first, I think, in console history anyway. Um, and then you compare that to the PlayStation, but the PlayStation 1 versions of 2D titles were absolutely abysmal. Street Fighter Alpha 2, for example, was really noticeably worse, as well as X-Men Children the Atom on the PlayStation 1, simply because of the memory disparity, and this is further exacerbated by the 4 megabyte RAM card that was available on the uh, Saturn. Although, of course, the Saturn died a horrible death anyway, but even if you take a look at the PlayStation 2 era, the PlayStation 2 had a pretty damn complex and convoluted uh, method. You had to basically rely on its side processors as well as, of course, the main processor, um, which really helped to get a lot of performance out of the machine, but it was a bit quite tricky to do. It also had less RAM. Um, then let's go with the Xbox, the original Xbox. The Xbox One was noticeably more powerful, especially out of the box. But you know what? The PlayStation 2 stole ruffle stomped over everything. Even the, X even the GameCube was more powerful than uh, the PlayStation 2. And... It didn't matter. I think we'll all agree that, okay, the Xbox One did win a couple of... Uh, sorry, the original Xbox. I keep saying the Xbox One because I'm used to Xbox One and Xbox 360. But anyway, the original Xbox did win a couple of wars, most likely on you know the online scenario. It completely decimated the PlayStation 2. But in terms of sales and popularity and exclusives and so on, sure, the Xbox did have games like Halo um, and a couple of other titles that were quite nice, uh, exclusive ports, for example, from the PC, such as Star Wars the Knights of the Old Republic, which I'm a huge fan of, and, say, uh, Elder Scrolls Three. But overall, many people that agree completely and utterly that, well, that didn't really matter. The PlayStation 2 did decimate it, dominate it, and control it. It had, of course, titles like, say, Final Fantasy. It had games like God of War, uh, and so on and so forth. So, in other words, power does not equal 
always to the most popular or the most happy console. You know what? Let's let's make a complete uh, fantasy world up just for a second. Let's assume that the Xbox One somehow manages to outsell the PlayStation um, Four or keeps on the same par. But you can bet your bottom dollar that cross-platform developers are not going to release titles on the PlayStation Four. Um, and not on the Xbox One, if all there is is, say, a difference in resolution, you're still going to get it on the Xbox One, you just might get slightly crappier texture quality or whatever. This comes to another slight point, and probably one of my final points, because this is already getting fairly lengthy, and I'd hope to keep it fairly brief, but there you have it, you don't always get what you want. Um... The major one, of course, is that the PlayStation, uh, sorry, the uh, Xbox One, of course, has the cloud technology. I've mentioned how I don't like that in some ways. I do kind of wonder and worry how developers are really going to stop pushing that for cross-platform games. But there you have it. Regardless, um, I think that the Xbox One has definitely started to pick up a lot of steam. I think that the Xbox One has improved significantly in the hearts and the minds of the players. And I think that Microsoft have done a pretty good uh, damage control. Sony do say, well, you know what, you guys have, um, you know, changed your message a lot. Microsoft's have spun it and they've said, well, no, we've simply just, li you know, listened to our uh, fan base and player base and so on. Um, and there you have it. I personally don't think that the Xbox One is going to do bad mill launch at all, which is a completely different uh, prediction what I made just a couple of you know months ago. I thought that the Xbox One was going to absolutely do awful, but Microsoft have started to turn it round. There's still some issues I don't like about the system. There are still some privacy concerns, of course. There are still you know uh, stigmas that you can't get rid of, for example, regarding the you know the performance requirements, or sorry, I say the poor performance of the system in terms of the graphics and so on. But you know what? People say all of this. People say the performance, the graphics. But you know what, if you want the shiniest graphics, and this is going to sound really harsh, but just buy a PC, you know, um, a cheap PC, like £400 or so, you can get a better uh, looking game than what you can on the PlayStation 4. That's just a given. Look at the T-flops of the PS4 GPU compared to the PC. And, you know, that's just how it is. So you're really buying the games for the exclusives. So I'd I'd really encourage people to look at the exclusives for both consoles. Um, this is what I've done. I just happen to prefer the looks of, say, Killzone, but I'm definitely going to be buying an Xbox One. And just say, you know what? What games do I prefer exclusive-wise on the systems? And then just go from there. And I think that Microsoft have done a pretty good job for the ex uh, exclusives. I don't agree with them that it's the strongest lineup ever, but to be honest with you, most console lineups in terms of the initial games that are released suck, right? There's the odd game, like for example, I've bought the PlayStation 2 on launch, I bought the original uh, Saturn, I bought the Saturn on launch, I bought uh, the Xbox 360 on launch, I've bought a couple of other titles, uh, games, consoles on basically launch, or as close to launch as you could possibly get, and yeah, I mean, you had the old game here and there, but I remember even on the Xbox 360, I was playing like Perfect Dark and a couple of other games, you know, quite substantially, but it wasn't exactly amazing. I mean, yeah, sure, they're okay, but graphically, you know, no better than the PC, but still, I really was enjoying the experience, and of course, Gears of War came out and so on, and the console started to pick up steam, and this is just how it happens, so you have to look at what the games are going to be released on both. I do, however, applaud Microsoft for changing their tune somewhat. I would argue, of course, that they're basically just um, changed it for the sake of the fact that they had no choice, and I think this is an evolution that's been forced upon them. I don't like some of the original policies that I've mentioned, uh, such as, for example, the always online requirements. I absolutely hated that. Not necessarily because I don't like used games, but simply because what about if the you know, the server goes down, you're absolutely boned, you can't play uh, your own games, I don't like that at all, I don't like their reliance on cloud technology for a couple of reasons as well that I've uh, harked on about slightly in this video, but in others as well, so I do prefer the PlayStation 4 quite significantly in those regards, but um, I think the PlayStation 4 and Xbox Ones are going to be pretty close on launch. It's going to be very interesting to see what consumers actually want. Of course, in the UK, for example, you've got about £80 um, difference in price. And I think that's going to be pretty substantial because people are going to look at that and say, well, you know what, for the price of the Xbox One, I can pick up a PS4 and two games. Um, 
whatever games they may be for the PlayStation. And that's kind of difficult to argue with, in my personal opinion. Uh, it really is, because, you know, people are on really tight budgets, especially since they're both going to be released pretty much on Christmas time. You've got to remember that a lot of parents are going to be buying this for their kids. And, of course, that's not to say that all, you know, a lot of gamers now are like 25 plus because, you know, they've been gaming since, say, the PlayStation 2 era. And, of course, that was, you know, whatever time ago. So, let's say, even if you've been gaming since Xbox 360, that was like, you know, six, seven, eight years. You know, you've probably been gaming now on Xbox 360. Let's say you didn't buy it on launch. Say it wasn't your, let's say, even if it's your first console, you didn't buy it on launch. You've still been gaming five, six years. Um, considering the console's been out, like, what is it, eight years now, I think? That's still pretty substantial. So even if you bought it when you were like, you know, 18, you're probably, you know, early 20s by now, you're probably starting to work. But still, you can still make those decisions. I think Microsoft have made some good choices and I think they are starting to uh, really win back the hearts of the customers. I think they are starting to improve. With all of that said, I still prefer the actual overall architecture of the PlayStation 4 by quite a substantial amount. I'm talking about the actual way the console was designed, as in, the memory systems, the um, the actual uh, actual chips inside it. I much prefer the PlayStation 4. I do prefer the fact that Connect isn't bundled. Oh, so the I isn't bundled. I do prefer that they've got a lower price point. But I think for many people, it's not going to be like the the absolute slaughter that many people predicted it to be initially. Where you know I was looking at polls and it was something like 40 percent. Um, in some cases, if people weren't even considering buying an Xbox One, you know, no matter what they did. And that's gone down a lot, a lot. Now you're getting to the point where, you know, back in the day, it was like, you know, one or two out of every ten people would buy an Xbox One at launch. Uh, most people are going for the PlayStation 4. Now it's not quite that, that. Now it's getting more even. It's by no means even. Most people still are slightly preferring Sony. But it, I think for people who are more on the fence, it's no longer that... It's you know you're still you're being basically pushed off the fence by Microsoft into the Sony camp. Now Microsoft is starting to do their own thing. With that all said, however, it's still really really early, and I think that yes, both consoles have a hell of a lot of work to do. Uh, I think the first couple of months is going to be really paramount for both. I'm hoping that neither console has huge issues, such as say. I don't know, the Red Ring of Death fiasco for the Xbox, that was really bad. Hopefully it's not going to happen again. Microsoft has said, well, it's not. Sony and Microsoft have both said, well, the systems run cool, there shouldn't be any issues. The PlayStation had its fa PlayStation 3 had its fair share of issues, but no, by, my, no, um, by no means, I'm sorry, if I can speak bloody English, by no means as prevalent as, say, the PS4. Uh, sorry, as the Xbox 360. God, you know I'm tired. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, and while I can still maintain a semblance of speaking my own native language, I'm going to get going. Uh, I still have to do a few bits and pieces, unfortunately, and then I have a long day ahead. But hopefully you guys have found the video somewhat debate-worthy anyway. By all means, you can uh, reach me on Facebook, facebook.com slash redgamingtech. We can look at the bar at the bottom. And I will see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.